A big applause to Mike Hill. He's uh, one of my favorite artists since long time. Um, so Andre asked me to come and do a talk, and I decided that the talk would be about Jurassic Park. Now the reason for that is because I presume that most of us have seen Jurassic Park, and also maybe Jurassic World. What I wanted to talk about was the difference between them, which is, on the surface, they're pretty much identical. They have the same cinematography, they have the same subject, they have the same material, they have the same pretty much everything. Every surface attribute has been lifted from Jurassic Park. But yet somehow, when I finish watching Jurassic World, I feel a big, vague emptiness where there should be a feeling of positivity. I wanted to actually look deep down below the surface of the film of Jurassic Park and really get to grips with why we like it. So for me, a story is a lot like a bridge. Now, if you spend your entire life looking at a bridge from the perspective of the roadside and someone asks you to make a bridge. You might look at what's here and say, well, it's just a roadside, there's some paint, and there's some, some handrails at the side, and that's what a bridge is composed of. But obviously, we're all made of common sense, and we know that from the perspective of anywhere but the roadside, you know that a bridge is made up of foundations, supports, it's an entire engineering project, and that's the same with a story. It isn't just composed of its surface, it's composed of lots and lots of foundational elements. And if you don't have those foundational elements, then your bridge collapses and your surface, regardless of its materials, looks broken and no one can travel across it. And it's the same with a story. In the case of Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, one story holds up for 25 years and we still love it. The other one was released, like what, like a year ago? Does anyone even remember what the characters' names were? So, if we look at Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, they're both blockbusters. They're both big summer releases, and they're based on the high concept format. In the case of Jurassic Park, it's what if we could clone dinosaurs? Now, today's blockbusters, Jurassic World included, they take that high concept and they take it literally. They say, well, how many dinosaurs can we have on screen? Now, the problem with this is that it doesn't take into account that people are watching this movie, and people don't respond to just lots and lots of dinosaurs. What Spielberg does instead is he takes the high concept and he makes it secondary to a human story and then he uses dinosaurs as ways to support that story. The dinosaurs in Jurassic Park are symbolic tools. They are literally there as a narrative function. Now, the way Spielberg does this is by using allegories. Now, an allegory is a narrative that metaphorically represents an abstract idea. The whole point of Jurassic Park is that it's actually an allegory for becoming parents. Now, I'm going to quickly show you a clip from Jurassic Park. I just want you to pay close attention to what's happening in this sequence, what's being said, and generally the production design and the setting. Well, postmortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments. Velociraptor? Yeah, it's good shape, too. And look at the half-moon-shaped bones on the wrist. It's no one of these guys learn how to fly. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. Because Velociraptor's a pack hunter, you see. He uses coordinated attack patterns, and he is out in force today. And he slashes at you with this six-inch retractable claw, like a razor. Hey, Alan, if you wanted to scare the kid, you could have pulled a gun on him, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. Kids. You want to have one of those? I don't want that kid, but a breed of child, Dr. Grant, could be intriguing. Now, Jurassic World simply has characters that do stuff randomly around VFX dinosaurs. In Jurassic Park, the VFX dinosaurs are specifically doing things to support the narrative of the allegory, which is becoming parents. So, if you look at the high concept about cloning dinosaurs, then the big questions are, what kind of responsibility is involved in creating that life? And the same questions are being played in the allegorical thread, which is creating children. You're asking questions, can we be responsible for life? So the allegory and the high concept are exchanging the same questions, and that creates subtext. Now, the powerful thing about subtext is that when a character says one thing about something, it can mean something else on an entirely different level. 
which means that dinosaurs and people talking about chaos theory can actually resonate emotionally. So one of the ways that one of the things that Spielberg uses to get these ideas across is archetypes. Now, when you've got a complex idea that's something like chaos theory and the idea of responsibility for life, and you need to display it in a two-hour movie for kids and adults and grandchildren and grandparents, then you need to basically show everything through a filter that we automatically understand culturally and socially. Now, the archetypes in Jurassic Park are chaos and control, which is devil and God. Now, it may seem like the idea of chaos and control isn't a big deal, but that's the factor in all of our lives. We have weather forecasts because we love the idea of controlling what we're going to wear, what we're going to do. And when it comes to kids, that element of control and chaos is absolutely fundamental. So the whole concept of chaos theory in Jurassic Park is there to be a sounding board for these two characters preparing to have children. I'm going to show you a quick supercut of how these archetypes show up in regards to the devil and to God. Who in God's name do you think you are? John Hammond. I own an island. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Well, John doesn't subscribe to chaos, particularly what it has to say about his little science project. Oh, I'll swallow Ian. I insist oh. on being here when they're born. Helps them to trust me. I can tell instantly about people. It's a gift. I don't blame people for their mistakes, but I do ask that they pay for them. Thanks, Dad. I've been present for the birth of every little creature on this island. I'm not going to cut you. I well, do wish you know. wouldn't do Dr. that. Dr. Sadler, Dr. Grant, you've heard, of, you've heard of chaos theory? <laughs> So it seems like a, a fairly obvious point, but the entire idea of the chaos theory and the God complex is there to reflect something that's socially relevant to these guys creating life. This becomes a lens to see things through. So I'm going to stay away from that element. I'm going to stick to the main allegory thread, which is about becoming parents, and to show how that ends up resonating in every single scene in the film. So the idea for the allegory is preparing for parenthood. So the best way to get the audience primed for that allegory without them knowing it is to start putting in ideas into the, the fabric of the film that they're not necessarily aware of. The first act in the film is about the idea of a symbolic pregnancy. It's the idea of becoming parents. The second act then leads into what would be the, the, the end result of becoming parents. That's parental responsibility. And then the third part of the film is about pregnancy and the parental responsibility lead to a family unit. It's a very human thread. So if we start with a symbolic pregnancy and think about how this resonates through the first act. Now, the first thing we see these guys doing, Alan is looking at a dead dinosaur and he's obsessed with velociraptors. And they're looking at an ultrasound screen. It's a screen that's the, that normal couples would be looking at when they're preparing to have a baby. Then Don arrives in his helicopter and whisks them away to a missile island. Now, the Brachiosaurus is there to be this miraculous moment where both Ellie and Alan both marvel at life. They then go through to a fertility clinic and then get told the process, sex education-wise, about how to create life in this slightly odd and slightly unusual way compared to normal life, which allows people to reflect upon a very common idea, having children, but in an unusual context. And then they experience simulation of childbirth through the, the birth of the raptor. And the entire time, we've got these two people, these two everyday people with very common problems that are basically being chaperoned around this guided tour of life by archetypal god and archetypal devil. Now, the reason that we resonate with this is because these are human issues being dressed up as very exotic ideas. So. When we move into the next realm, these two people have to take on the responsibility of the product of pregnancy, which is children. So our children arrive, they're the grandchildren of God, and if you've paid attention to the beginning, very beginning of the film, there's a very, very small line that states that Hammond's daughter is getting divorced, which means subtextually that these children are orphans and these two people are potential parents. They then go and visit the Triceratops. Now, Here's our first like, major dinosaur beyond the Brachiosaurus. And the function of this dinosaur is not to look like a cool dinosaur. That's not the reason it's there. The reason the Triceratops is there is to confirm to us that Ellie is ready to have kids. If you watch this scene, 
pay attention to the dialogue that Spielberg has given to Ellie to use, and look at the way she reacts to this Triceratops. What Spielberg is doing is he's masking the, the very, very understandable story that we all have as adults, and he's hiding it under a layer of dinosaurs and theme parks and allegories. So if we look at this Triceratops and we listen to what she says, hey baby girl, she cries, he says it's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen, this is all what people say when a baby is born. And then she then continues to look after the Triceratops and sticks her hand in poo. Now, the point logically of the poo is that she's looking for the toxins that made this Triceratops sick. But you could look for the, the sickness in any number of ways. You could take a blood sample, you could do any number of things. But the allegory dictates, in the case of Spielberg, that you have to have a pile of dung. Because that way the audience starts to resonate, we start to resonate with what she's actually doing. She's taking maternal care of a sick animal and changing its nappy. Now, it seems really, really obvious when you think about it, and it is obvious, but unless you're aware of it, you don't necessarily plug it consciously. At this point in the story, we need to logically understand that Ellie is going to stay with the Triceratops, and Alan is going to go with the children. They need to be separated, because at this point, it's all about his trial. Now, he's not shown any signs yet of being willing to become a father figure, so now he needs to be put through a metaphorical trial that shows he's ready to be a parent. So what Spielberg uses here is a couple of metaphorical symbols which all tie into the allegory, and that is eggs, birth, tree houses, and fire. Right? And what I want you to pay attention to is that in this scene, the function, think about the function of the Tyrannosaurus Rex, is not to be a scary monster. He's there to represent the paternal instinct of Dr. Grant. Dr. Grant? showing that shot mainly because it's awesome <laughs> and secondly because I honestly do not think that any shot in Jurassic World despite 25 years of VFX progress looks as good as that and the reason it doesn't look as good as that is that we resonate with this because somehow we know what's going on in this story because it's working on an archetypal level. Now, if you look at the framing of this we've got the devil and Alan in one car and we've got two isolated children who have just been deserted by a lawyer and between them is a giant monster that's just become uncaged from his realm. This is a Jungian archetype. This is the idea of his psychological fear of commitment escaping the cage and now he has to face up to real commitment to the children. So the next shot, I want to show, show how Spielberg now illustrates the, the idea of Dr. Grant becoming ready to take control of these kids. Notice how personal this situation is. This isn't 60 frames a second, cameras rotating at 10 miles an hour through every single possible point of access. This is one man who's just rediscovered his primal instinct and has rediscovered fire and is now taking control of the situation with a wild animal. It's not a massive VFX-like fest. This is him 
next to this broken husk of a car with two children who are on the brink of metaphorical extinction. That's what this scene is about. The reason that scenes like this are powerful is because they're operating with archetypal scenarios. Now, the car in this scene is an egg, right? So at this point, the broken car is, is it's a broken shell, it's been compressed, these two children are being buried in the mud, and then he births Lex, right? So this is the birth of their new relationship together. It's not the birth physically, it's them forming a new relationship to each other that's not about him hating kids. Then the T-Rex, which is a symbol for him not being committed to kids, forces all three of them back into the primal realm, right? He forces all of them into the park where society doesn't function, intellectual ideas don't function, archaeology doesn't function. The whole point of this, and if you think about it, it doesn't even logically make sense because the T-Rex just stepped out of that giant abyss. Now, Spielberg has intentionally got that drop there, even though it doesn't make logical sense, in the same way that Kubrick moves doors into illogical places in The Shining. It's there to unnerve us and make it mythological. In the next stage, the car is sent down into the tree, right? And I just want you to pay attention to a couple of things here. The situation that that, that puts all three of them into, and also what the subtext of what they're saying means. Listen, Lex, I'm right here. I'm gonna look after you, but I have to go help you, brother. So I want you to stay right here and wait for me. He left us. He left us. But that's not what I'm gonna do. Okay? Stay here. So I'm gonna pause that for a sec. So when she says, he left us, he left us, and she says that twice before when she's in the car, he left us, he left us, he left us, he left us. That's a hell of a lot of screenplay space to be using up for what seems like an absolutely incidental throwaway line. But it's not incidental, because in the opening shot, Spielberg sets up that these two children are currently going through a divorcing family. So when she says he left us, she's not talking about the literal event of the lawyer leaving her in the car, because that wouldn't leave that much of a scar. She's talking about the idea that the father figure left us. Right? So when he says, but that's not what I'm going to do, the subtext is what's making us react. It's not the text, it's not the literal events, it's the subtext. And now he goes to get Tim. Stand on the door. Hang on a minute. Okay. Okay, it's not too bad, right, Tim? Yes, it is. It's just like coming out of a treehouse. Did your dad ever build your treehouse? No. Damn it, Tim. Not him. Well, we're back in the car again. Well, at least you're out of the tree. Now, there are two elements to that car falling out of the tree which are really important to note. Now, the car has already been an egg on the top side, it's already been a symbolic egg, and then it becomes a symbolic treehouse. Now, the whole reason that that chain of events happens, that particular sequence of action sequence of the car coming down the tree, isn't because of some arbitrary need for an action sequence. The logical chain of events is that the allegory dictates that Spielberg needs these symbols. Then, now they've got those symbols, that dictates what situations need to happen in order for this to unfold. So the allegory drives the creative process. So when the car comes down and then ends on top of them, that isn't a throwaway idea. And you'll see in the next scene that it's being used because now the car is an egg again. And I want to show you how that plays out. It's a dinosaur egg. The dinosaurs are breeding. Look. I found a way. They're not here. Now, what Spielberg is doing is he's setting up a symmetry so that you unconsciously create a relationship between the two events. Now, on the biological level, what Malcolm, the chaos theory guy, talks about at the beginning of the film, life will find a way. 
that manifests in the, the animals, the females of, of Jurassic Park breeding and creating life. And these shells are evidence of that. But they are at the base of a tree in exactly the same way that the broken shell of the car is at the base of the tree. And the idea is that there's a parallel between life finds a way socially and life finds a way biologically. That's there to show us that what's actually happening here is that a new life is being found in the relationship between Alan and the two kids. So now we go further into the allegory of this guy on a very warped and twisted uh, day out with the kids at a theme park. And now they go up in another tree and they start to interact with the Brachiosaurus. Now, the function of this scene, we saw the Brachiosaurus before. It was used in the opening scene when they arrive at Jurassic Park, and it was what he and Ellie used to marvel at life. It was the miraculous opening shot of seeing a dinosaur. And that's now used as a symmetry with him creating a family unit with these two children. The positivity of the opening scene and the positivity of this scene are both mirroring each other. So in the opening scene, we saw that, that he's scaring out of that kid. Now, Spielberg is making us associate Alan with a raptor. Now, he, he openly talks about his respect for raptors, about how they're pack hunters, about how they're like vicious, brutal animals. And he uses that knowledge and a prop to scare the living out of kids. And in this scene, as he forges this new relationship, Spielberg uses that same prop to make sure that we understand his internal shift. Now, these props these sets, these production designs, these scenarios are all ways to externalize an internal shift in the characters. That doesn't exist in Jurassic World. None of that happens. So what ha is happening with Alan at the moment is he's going from an intellectual that obsesses over dead animals, and he's now becoming somebody that's interested socially in living creatures. This is the shift he's taking, and this is what we're learning through the props and through the scenarios. The next morning they wake up, and now it's the birth of a new situation. Now. The entire thing is framed. He's developed into a father figure. He's now going to the petting zoo. He's interacting with the kids, almost as if they're his own. But that's not the end of his growth. So we need to escalate things. So as they make their way back towards the visitor center, the allegory requires that we keep strengthening the bond between the children. And what better way to strengthen the bond and to remind us of the function of the T-Rex. So the T-Rex comes back for the second time. He only features three times with these characters because he has a function that represents something. They then get redirected to the fence where Tim is electrocuted and effectively dies, right? Now, we've already established a strong bond between Lex and Tim and Alan by having him save both of them individually in different scenarios. But now to really up the ante, we need to make something happen very, very symbolic. And that is that Alan needs to give life, literal life to Tim. Now, this is as close as it gets to being an actual, literal father figure. Um, so now, the third act is where we have to make them unify as a family. Now, we're sticking with the allegory here, remember? We're not detouring just for the sake of showing a 60-foot T-Rex running around in a park. So now, we bring in the big guns, which is the raptor. Now, we've already established throughout the entire film that Alan was, in the beginning, a metaphorical raptor. And now, he's thrown away his, his, uh, his claw, and now we face up to the biggest threat that all of them have got, which is these guys basically attacking the children when they're by themselves. So the children now use the responsibility and the, the things they've learned from the role model in the previous scenes, and they look after each other. So this is a socially responsible film, which Jurassic World isn't. Um, so, <laughs> so then once the kids go through their personal journey looking after each other, the whole family unit is returned to, to, to work together. Now, Alan then faces up to the raptor. The first time he's seen what he was admiring at the beginning of the film, sees it face to face, that's the function of this shot. He gets to see it in the eye and see what it really is. And what is he seeing? He's seeing himself in the eye. That's the whole point of the raptor, it's a symbol. So they then work as a team and you'll notice <laughs> That, as cheesy as it is, Lex using that computer in a completely illogical way, the whole point of that is to, to show that, at the beginning of the film, if you'll remember, when, uh, when Alan touches the monitor for the ultrasound, he breaks it. And the whole thread is, oh, machines hate him. Now, the whole point of that thing, the whole point of that incidental moment, is to make sure that when the family unit becomes unified, 
that it shows that there's been a progress. So what we're learning and what Alan is learning is that he's better off in the family unit, things that he can't do or things that he's not capable of, the next generation, his girlfriend, his wife, his children can help him out with. It's a whole progression of him as an individual. So then the big trial is, and this is the point where he comes to an absolute point of being a real father figure, is when he has to put his own life on the line. So the shot, when the raptors finally go to attack him, and he puts everything down, and he's ready to give his life, and make sure as best he can to save this family, this metaphorical family, then what happens in a moment where there's absolutely no chance of him winning? Our T-Rex comes back. Now the T-Rex is the one that came out of the cage and forced this journey to start. It's the one that forced them to the electric fence and got Tim killed and forced Alan to resurrect Tim. This T-Rex is a symbolic T-Rex. He's not there to be a biological threat, he's there to be a symbolic motivator for Alan. So at this point, they're a family unit. They head back to the helicopter. And at this point, you'll notice the whole theme, just pay attention to the theme of Alan's theory that dinosaurs evolve into birds. So the general idea, gonna wrap this up now. The whole thing about Jurassic Park is it's a symbolic evolution. And that's why we resonate with it because it's coming at us from every single level. Now, the idea of the Brachiosaurus, it represents family. The Triceratops represents the idea of maternal instinct. The T-Rex symbolizes paternal instinct as well in terms of father figure. The uh, Velociraptor represents just brutal nature, and then the bird represents the evolution of the characters into something bigger than themselves. This is what we're responding to when we watch Jurassic Park. This is what's happening here, not up here. In summary, if you look at Jurassic Park, the reason that it stands strong 23 years later is because its foundations are strong. Its foundations are built on allegory, archetypes, metaphor, subtext, motifs, and symbolism. And Jurassic World. <laughs> so the reason I talked about this today is because I would love to go and see a summer blockbuster that revolves around this and not this. Uh, and maybe if a conversation is started, we might start seeing something like that. Uh, so thank you. <laughs>